And now I will take it on to my uh, our uh, Latin, Latin Alumni Network President, Ms. Natalie Guerra. Thank you so much, Jose. Good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Guerra. I am the president for the Latinx Alumni Network, and it is a pleasure to have you all here with us today. I will be presenting our panelists. Today, we have PG Council member, Denita Veras. Denita Veras was reelected for her second four-year term on the Prince George's County Council in 2018. In 2020, she was elected as vice chair, making history as the first Latina elected to her seat and to a leadership role on the council. As council member, she has attracted $10 billion worth of investments from both private and public sources, and she put eight schools and two libraries in the pipeline for construction in her district. Taveras is a strong advocate for education equity and social justice issues, seeking to improve the lives of working families and diverse communities. She chairs the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's Climate Energy and Environment Policy Committee and is a member of the Local Workforce Development Board. Taveras holds a dual master's degree in public affairs and urban regional planning from Princeton University School of International and Public Affairs, a master's degree from the University of Utah, and a bachelor's degree from Barnard College, the latter two in chemistry. Then we have our UMD alumna, Flavia Negrete. She graduated in 2019 with a double major in biochemistry and neurophysiology. She is a bioinformatics graduate student at Maryland and a research assistant in the Virulence Mechanism Division at the FDA studying Chronobacter. She previously worked with the Rockville Fire Station as an EMT and plans to go to medical school one day. Last but not least, we have Joshua Gavilano. He is an EMT first responder with the Loudoun County Fire and Rescue. He received his LPN from the Academies of London. He's a medical assistant at Act Fast Urgent Care, as well as a resident assistant at eight, uh, Spring Arbor. Uh, Joshua Gavilano has been working at Spring Arbor Assisted Living for the last two years. He is familiar with nursing protocols and procedures upheld during the pandemic. He has been labeled a frontline healthcare worker and has been vaccinated since January. He worked at, as a first responder for the Loudoun County Fire and Rescue and received his licensed practical nursing from the 2018 Academies of Loudoun. So without further ado, I leave this presentation to our wonderful panelists that we have tonight. And if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat room. Thank you so much and enjoy. Welcome everybody to our wonderful uh, COVID-19 community event. We are very happy to have you all and we are very happy to have our panelists here joining us. Our co-hosts for today are myself, Pam Vega, and we will also be joined, um, be joined by uh, Karen Guzman, uh, who is also on the call. Today, we're going to be running through an agenda with um, questions um, about vaccine safety and uh, the science of the vaccine, also eligibility and how to register and any resources that may be available. Karen and I are going to be asking our panelists questions and we then will open up the floor after uh, every topic um, for you all to ask your questions, whatever questions you may have. We will answer those and um, move on to our next topic. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our first question for our panelists. What is the COVID-19 vaccine and what is the science behind the COVID-19 vaccine? So I, I feel like I can take this question. Um, uh, responder en español primero para nuestras audiencias en español. La vacuna es bien simple, contiene cuatro ingredientes, uh, básicamente una proteína del virus, que no es el virus y solo, pero solamente uh, una proteína del virus afuera que actúa para incrementar la respuesta inmune de la persona. También tiene sal, azúcar y agua. No tiene nada más que esos cuatro ingredientes. Um, la vacuna está hecha para promover 
la respuesta inmune de la persona y eh, para proveer una, una defensa antes de que la persona tenga un tipo de síntoma grave con, cuando se infecta con el virus. Thank you, Flavia. I'm just going to ask if Hilda can interpret that for us in English. Give me one. I, I can say it in English as well, if you guys like. Oh, OK. That yeah. Was, <laughs> this is much uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically, uh, you know, the vaccine is pretty straightforward. It's a simple four uh, step ingredient, it has water, sugar, salts, and the spike protein that surrounds the outside of the uh, virus. And it, its intent is to kind of build uh, immunity to the host, which in this case would be the human, so that in the future cases when you have a virus uh, infection or when you're exposed to the virus, you have those antibodies present to defend yourself and prevent severe symptoms such as, you know, going on a ventilator and possible uh, hospitalization. Thank you, Flavia, Flavia for that interpretation. Could you also um, tell us a little bit more about the effects, the most common effects that we are seeing um, with the COVID-19 vaccine with actually the first dose and maybe the second dose, depending on which of the vaccines you get? I'll take that question. So I've gotten the vaccine mid-January and with the first dose that I've gotten, um, all I, all of that I experienced was pretty much like pain in my arm and it was like a bit swollen but after that I just felt tired the whole day but a couple of days after that I just felt totally normal and same thing goes with the second vaccine too and I got that at the end of January too like two weeks after so and it's been like more than a month and I feel totally completely fine so like I'm I'm still able to do all my activities I usually do before the vaccine and after so, and also one of the main sim uh, side effects that I've seen or like that I've read was pain, redness, swelling in the arm when you receive you received the shot. And as well, one of them was being tired and I've experienced that too. And headache, muscle pain, chills, fever and nausea. But like for me, I didn't get any of those and I felt completely fine after like two days. So, so for me, let me just jump in. That, that's the young buck talking. Let me talk about being a little bit older. <laughs> so the first shot, it was like Joshua said, it was you know just a little bit of pain and you moved your arm and it was cool. The second one put through, took me out. Yeah, the second day, um, it took me about a week to recover. And I had a little bit of fever and um, um, I had to, the doctors that I spoke to basically said it actually, if you do experience these types of symptoms, is that it actually shows you that the that the vaccine is working because it's actually developing um, it's the immunity inside your body and is actually showing you that it, that there's a reaction taking place and and and, and protect and showing the uh, increasing the level of protection. So. And so that's why it takes a little bit of time for that to, to, to take place in your body. And it took about a week for me to get back to normal. So, so just to translate that. Cuando tomé la vacuna la primera vez, Joshua dijo que no le pasó nada, que quizá le tuvo un poquito de dolor y estaba un poquito cansado, pero se sentía básicamente normal. Pero para mí, la primera vez que me lo tomé, eh, me dolía el brazo, pero no, no tanto. Pero la segunda vacuna, Eh, yo tomé la moderna, me noqueó. Eh, eso, el primer, el segundo día tenía fiebre, me sentía un poquito mal y los doctores con que hablé dijo que actualmente eso enseña que la vacuna está funcionando porque se está creando eh, el sistema, está mejorando el sistema inmune para crear una, eh, una defensa dentro del cuerpo para proteger el cuerpo. So, con eso yo me sentí un poquito más, you know, tranquila y... Y para adelante con los farones, <laughs> como dicen. Uh, another question that I think a lot of people in our community are having in regards to the vaccine are now there's three different ones, right? We have the Moderna, we have the Pfizer, and now recently, at least in 
in PG County, right? Our newest one is the Johnson and Johnson and in a lot of parts of the US. So what, what would you all say are the main differences? Like for folks who just are hearing all these names, what does that mean to them? What, what um, takeaways would you like them to have from these different vaccines? Um, I, I, let's, let's get down to like the specifics of what makes the vaccine different. Um, I think the biggest and most um, important things to take away is the way that the vaccines work and the efficacy that these vaccines bring about. So for the Pfizer and the Moderna, they're working with um, uh, something called the spike protein. Um, I won't get into the science behind it, but it basically activates your immune system pretty quickly. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine works with an adenovirus, which is a more, uh, it's a slower process to activate your immune response, but it still works in, you know, the overall way and activates your immune response, but it may take a little longer. Um, I know that the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, uh, excuse me, just the Pfizer vaccine is meant for 16 and older, whereas the Moderna vaccine, as well as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is for 18 and older. Currently, there are no vaccines available for minors, uh, just because the science hasn't really tested minors and we don't want to take chances uh, vaccinating kids without any research behind it. Um, all three um, vaccines go through a muscle injection. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, is a one dose versus the two doses for the Moderna and the Pfizer. Um, and all of them work around 10 to 14 days after the first shot uh, to promote that immunity. So in terms of the differences, it's very particular. Um, obviously, there has been a lot more people um, vaccinated with the Pfizer and the Moderna, predominantly because they have been first out since December and early January. Um, and the Johnson & Johnson is still picking up trail but all are great vaccines and all have been emergency approved by the FDA. Wonderful. And, and Flavia, can you explain a little bit more about what the FDA approval requires? Uh, there are concerns that, you know, these vaccines were uh, pushed out or were developed pretty quickly and they came on the market pretty quickly shortly thereafter a um, pandemic. Can you, can you let us know how the, the approval process the FDA takes? Yeah, so emergency use authorization is a need-based uh, protocol that the FDA uses, predominantly in cases of extreme concern, in this case, the pandemic and how it kind of shifted our lifestyles. Uh, the FDA looks at it very cut and clear. Does the vaccine work in people? And if so, what age ranges, what demographics of people does it work on? Is there a specific group that it works on better or worse? And uh, one of the biggest factors that they look at is uh, side effects and reactions to the vaccine. You know, everybody doesn't have the same past medical history as everybody else. So what they try to gather is people from different backgrounds and different past medical history backgrounds in specific and see if they have an adverse reaction to the vaccine. Um, there were tested, uh, I think, I believe 100,000 participants for the Pfizer vaccine, and I can't remember what the exact number is for the Moderna, but these are a lot of people that are coming together and testing the vaccine. All these people have different types of background, and uh, they measured the antibody count, which is a good measure or marker to see how your immunity is uh, reacting to the virus. Um, and they also tested to see variability and uh, reducibility of the vaccine. So they wanted to see if the vaccine caused any post side effects after the vaccine, maybe two to three months out. Um, and so those were the main, uh, the main concerns of the FDA. Um, now, that said, there's still a lot of research to be made with all three vaccines, actually all the vaccines, you know, we don't know, in specific, how uh, minors may be affected by the vaccine because we just haven't tested them. We have abundant uh, research that a lot of kids, you know, all kids probably won't be affected by the vaccine because there's no real difference between an adult uh, that's 19 and a 17 year old in terms of immunity, at least for a normal person. Obviously, if you're immunocompromised, that's a different story. But the main overall message is that 
we want to have the data there before we go about, you know, injecting people with these vaccines. And that's why the FDA was confident enough to say, hey, there is pros to the vaccine getting distributed early January because we have seen that there's no severe side effects and there's more pros that outweigh, you know, the immunity buildup that the person's going to get. Um, and, and so I think that that really all factors into the FDA's, um, I guess, analysis into what the vaccine is. And, and you have to remember, it's not just the FDA testing this. The FDA brings about people from different universities, doctors, scientists, from different groups. Because one of the biggest, I guess, conspiracies out there is that FDA is trying to push a specific company or a specific group to produce a vaccine. And so what the FDA does to debunk that is say, hey, we're going to grab a small subset of FDA scientists, but the majority of the people that are approving these vaccines are doctors from Washington State. You know, there's people from Boston, there's people that, you know, work in the private sector, there's people that work in academia. So there's not just a group of FDA based uh, people approving the vaccine, but it's a conjunction of, of professionals in, in the area. Thank you, Flavia. That, thank you for expanding on the complexity that, that goes into uh, proving these vaccines um, for emergency utilization. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, we're going to open it up to the, our participants. Are there, is there any questions that you would like to ask our panelists on vaccine? What is the vaccine? What um, effects do we, should we see? Vaccine science and safety. Are there any questions? You can um, unmute yourself, ask your questions, or you can also put it in the chat and we will have our vice president monitoring the chat and asking your questions. Um, so please ask away. You all must be experts in this field. I <laughs> know, I know, but let me give you kind of, uh, while people warm up a little bit, let me let me spice things up. Okay. We love that, Denny, please. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I see a lot of people that I love here, uh, uh, Ms. Benavides, and uh, so a lot of you here, hello, welcome. Um, and I wanna say thank you to, to, to you all for inviting me on here. I mean, you guys are amazing and you guys are, you guys make me feel amazing just because you guys are so wonderful. I mean, you guys are the future of our community. So it makes me feel verklempt. So um, in terms of, uh, in terms of um, COVID-19 infections, I, I represent uh, District 2, even though I'm vice chair of the county council, I represent District 2, which encompasses the area of Adelphi Langley Park, Lewisdale, Carroll Highlands, all the way down to the DC borderline in Montgomery County, and the, um, the city of Hyattsville, Brentwood, North Brentwood, and, um, and uh, Mount Rainier. So that's the, my district. I have one of the smallest districts. Uh, in, in all of Prince George's County, and it's the densest district. It's also the district with the most foreign born. Um, over 50% of my population is foreign born, and it's also one of the areas that has the greatest amount of disadvantaged people, which means that we have some of the highest Latino populations um, uh, and, and immigrant populations, particularly in the Langley Park, about, we're talking about 80, 80 plus percent, 80 to 90 percent of the people here. Uh, this also is the area, the zip code 20783 is the area with the highest amount of COVID-19 cases in all of Virginia, DC, and Maryland, the state of Maryland. We are one out of every five people in the county um, is basically infected in my district, one out of every five. Um, in turn, and I would say that as of today, we have 76,000 cases um, over a little bit, 1.3 uh, deaths and about 7.7 um, hospitalizations as of today. And um, the case is that while we look at the racial data on African-Americans uh, or the racial breakdown on, on COVID-19 cases, 
it says that about 30,000 are African Americans and 18 or rather 19,000 are Latino. But the thing is that you have to also understand that Latinos, especially Latinos that are from abroad, are do not understand the concept of race the same way Americans do, right? So they are very hesitant or reluctant to disclose their race. And so therefore it's very unsurprising when you see that over 16,000 people have, are under the category of unknown. And so because of that, if you were to truly look at that number, you would actually in fact see that if we were to add the unknowns with Latinos, Latinos are overwhelmingly the number one group in the county that is overwhelmingly black to have been con to have contracted um, COVID. Uh, with that, uh, when we look at the vaccines dispersed and administered within the county, we, as of today again, uh, we've um, administered over, um, as of uh, 198,640. And of that, 116,000 people are African Americans that have been administered, and only 12,000 Latino. Um, 39,000 white, 9,000 Asians, and again, 11,000 unknown. Um, and so even if we add that, you could see that Latinos are still uh, within that 10%, 12% mark of that they're under that they're under that they're that they're vaccinated under the representation of population relative to you know that they're underrepresented in the vaccination program relative to their population in in society here in the county. So that's a concern um, to us all, right? And and I mean there and there could be a lot of justifications for that, right? And the fact that we as a population are relatively younger, you know, um, that that is. The average age of individuals in my district are 32 years old. Uh, and when we're looking at the phases and how it's being administered per CDC guidelines, they're targeting 75 year olds, um, 65, and now above anybody above 60. So that's not where we are. Um, but despite that, um, the reality is that we are the group that is for the most part, the poorest, the ones under the most housing stress, stress because we live in the most overcrowded conditions and the individuals that are for overwhelmingly, um, like I said, have the highest level of contagion within society. And we tend to work because of the nature of who we are and what we do. We tend to be, as Joshua, frontline workers, right? And essential workers um, because of what we do. And so the likelihood of us getting tested, um, and it's hard, right? Because to date, we haven't had one COVID-19 testing site within 20783 and one vaccine testing um, administration site within 20783. So that gives you a taste of what's the dynamics of what is occurring inside the county. Um, so, so that gives you a framing of what we need to do. The second thing is that I've been trying to work with a group to try to address the disparities that are occurring in the county, right? How do we target, right? Because I don't know if we've got questions yet. Let we do, we do, but um, you're- Okay, you're so I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and, and we'll go to the- <laughs> I just wanted to warm it up to give people- Thank a, you. A, in terms of the politics and, and the- and, and the level of societal discord in terms of what's happening. And, and we will definitely come back to you, <laughs> council member. We have a few questions for you as well on regard to those topics. So thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions here. Uh, the first one says, sorry, I'm just scrolling down to that. <laughs> it says, how could there be a vaccine for COVID-19 so quick but no cure for cancer or diabetes, for example. I, I think I can take this question. So um, COVID is a, it's a MERS virus, uh, which means there has been cases of COVID, not this specific COVID, but COVID virus in the past 
specifically 2002, there was a Middle Eastern outbreak with a very similar type of virus. So the science behind, you know, quote unquote, this virus was there. Um, the issue with these types of viruses is that they mutate pretty quickly, actually. I think COVID mutates four bases uh, every year. Um, what this means is that the science to support a vaccine for COVID was in the works for a while, but not to the level we needed it to be. You know, there were some research articles, there were some studies uh, kind of looking into mRNA technology, which is what the vaccine is based on, looking at how, you know, the virus is structured, what can we take to, you know, start that immune response. But we didn't have any clear cut research because there wasn't really a need, right? There wasn't really uh, this massive outbreak of COVID since, you know, pre-2020. So that said, the vaccine, and, and like I said, this wasn't, you know, a night's, a night's work. This was, you know, a lot of communities in the science field coming together and kind of really going in and, and trying every single protein that the virus has and seeing what gives me the best immunity. You know, we're talking about University of London, we're talking about NYU coming together um, with uh, UCLA, uh, you know, AstraZeneca also participating in that. There were a, a combination of uh, error and trials for this vaccine. and. Luckily enough, we had some kind of baseline to work on, which was those past studies I mentioned. But it wasn't, you know, as quick as people think it is, because a vaccine, you're right, does take four to five years normally. And that's because we try to reach every sector. We, we tested on immunocompromised. We tested on, you know, every possible past medical history present. With this vaccine, there was such a need to get a vaccine out there because the deaths and the hospitalizations and the ventilations were piling up that the pros of getting a vaccine that worked for, you know, adults was pushed so that it not only provided immunity, but it could reduce, you know, the stress on our hospitalization and our ICU units and all that stress that's been caused in terms of the medical sector. So to answer that question, it wasn't an overnight work. There was a lot of past studies um, that were used to kind of make this vaccine. And it was a collaboration between a lot of people. You know, it was a collaboration. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with this vaccine. I mean, just going into the minor section, we have to go in and study how this vaccine affects kids and how this vaccine may affect people that are immunocompromised. You know, those are things that normally when we are talking about a vaccine would be done in the process of putting out the vaccine. But because we needed this vaccine so badly and we saw only good results with it and no, you know, major side effects, then we were like the pros outweigh the cons. Let's push it out there and and let's and let's you know let's let's let it work its magic. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. And speaking and speaking on children, um, right, and folks who are immunocompromised, um, but specifically youth, there was a question that says, how long do you all think it will take in years for young children or even toddlers to be able to have an approved vaccine? If anyone has any thoughts. I, I think um, in terms of minors, I think right now we're working on that extremely quickly because at, I think the issue, I don't want to say issue, but the thing with minors is that they have such a well-bound immunity around teenage years. You know, people that are on the younger side tend to get COVID a lot less than people that are on the older side. So in a way, their immune system is, is well built for viruses like this, but there is a need to get vaccines out there for kids that are you know, neonates, infants, as well as kids that have asthma or some kind of respiratory distress issue. So right now, the uh, NIH is working in collaboration uh, with FDA and CDC to promote a virus for minors. 
um, hopefully we should see results uh, maybe by the end of this year or early next year for that. But we want to not take any chances with kids specifically because, you know, we just don't want to take any chances with kids. So we want to get that research in, you know, for every type, like I said, every type of demographic for every kid, make sure we got that vaccine, not giving any major side effects and giving them that protective immunity. Thank you. Pam, do you have another question? I have a question, please. Oh, sure. Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Patricia Benavides, and I am a parent engagement assistant with uh, Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, one of the reasons that I am here is because, of course, I want to educate myself and, you know, bring that information to families that I work with. Um, but um, this has been a very, very difficult year for everybody. Um, I am a COVID um, survivor. I have survived. I had COVID. My daughter was very, very sick. My husband, my mom. I mean, I had COVID in my family. I have lost family members. I have lost friends, colleagues, community partners. So it's 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 been unbelievable. So having said that, I am a COVID survivor. I already have my two vaccines, thanks God, because of war, because I work for the school system. And this week has been very stressful because the teachers came back to the buildings full time. Um, even though they keep telling everybody to follow the instructions to please cover their, you know, use the, the, the face mask to cover the nose. There's still people walking around with their face, with their mask, you know, under their nose. And I say, what part is it that you don't understand, please? So I guess one of my questions, oh, my question is, I have my two vaccines. Students are coming April 8th. Um, what are the odds of becoming infected again? after I had COVID and I had my two vaccines. Because it's in the, you know, in my mind, it's like, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Am I going to get COVID again? So that's my, my, my question. What are they as of becoming infected again? Yeah, and then that's a, that's a very valid point. Thank you for that question. Um, I understand your concern specifically when you've had so many people lost to COVID. Um, to answer it briefly, very low chances, almost non-existent. Um, it builds immunity in your system, which means you are protected from the virus, regardless of how many people around you are infected. What that doesn't mean is that if you have the virus, which you can have the virus if you have the vaccine, you can be a carrier, you won't get any symptoms, but people around you may become infected if they have not received the vaccine. Because unlike you, if they have not been vaccinated, they don't have that innate immunity that you would have if you were vaccinated. So uh, it's less of a concern of how you would be infected as more of a concern of people around you. If they weren't following protocol, um, how they may be affected by the virus from you know people that have been vaccinated and are carriers. So that's also a huge concern because even though I can be protected, I can be Right. Infecting somebody yes, else. Yes. Yeah. It, it, I like to call this vaccine a symptom vaccine. It prevents the symptoms from happening to you, but it doesn't prevent the spread of the virus from the person vaccinated. that's not vaccinated. Correct. Right. And yeah. so the idea of, you know, the science community is to get as many people vaccinated so that this problem won't happen. Because ideally, in a world where, you know, the majority of people are vaccinated, there won't be that risk of, oh, that person isn't vaccinated, they might grab the symptoms because I carry the virus. So that, that, that's the major mass vaccination movement. Okay, thank you. Council uh, member Taveras, do you wanna add anything? Yes, I do. Um, and Ms. Benavides knows me for many, many, many years. <laughs> so, um, and as for those of you who don't know, I mean, and I know she, I know she knows because some of the people we've lost are, are friends of ours, mutual friends, um, like Danisa Simpson and so forth. And here in the community, um, Guerreras, you know, down for the cause. But um, 
you know, I myself lost six family members and I had in my family 16 infections. So I don't know how many of you uh, were also aware of that. And I was, I mean, aware of individuals like in the community, like Ms. Benavides, uh, who were also directly affected in her daughter, Carla. But um, the other issue that we have is that, um, not, not issue, but I just want to say that we, I think we need to take, because of the disparities that are still existing within our communities of color and particularly immigrant communities, I think we need to take a little bit of a different approach than just following CDC guidelines of, you know, targeting those individuals that are 75 and, and going through that pyramid, that pyramid, so to speak. I think that to address Ms. Benavides's issue, I think it would be more powerful if we focused on vaccinating per household in, in communities like ours, because through, through, um, through household vaccinations, you handle the, the concerns of the, child, the, the parent or whoever that's working, uh, that's the, that's, um, that, or at least for the teenager, teenagers that are in our high schools, like Ms. Benavides. So those 16 and older are, would, would be um, addressed through that to, to protect our teachers. The, you would protect the parents and the people who, you know, are working as first responders and in the front lines and, and essential workers. And then you're also protecting the caretakers who are taking care of seniors and you're also protecting the seniors. So in a household, you're protecting the household unit and treating the household holistically, not just taking one piece at a time at a, at a three or a four month, over a three or four month period. You're treating it with a laser focus. And under that, given the natural, um, the, 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 the social dynamic of how our households exist, either rooming by rooming houses or people who illegally rent under the table through, through subleasing environments and arrangements, this is a way for us to tackle the whole problem entirely under one shot. Um, nobody's asking any questions. Nobody has to pay anything. You know, you bring everybody to the table and say, let's take care of you. Um, no questions asked. And so I think this is a more effective way to address given the nature of, you know, the communities in which we live. And we're trying to work on trying to figure out not just how to take this locally, statewide and nationally. So that's, that's my job. That's what I'm working on right now. Thank you so much. And, and I think that point right on households, uh, vaccination is really important. And it's something that a lot of people in our community are having questions about is who is eligible. I know that Governor Hogan also recently made an announcement on new eligibility requirements. So if um, any of the panelists would like to speak a little bit on as of today, March 19th, who is eligible for the vaccine and, and what phase would they belong to, right? What are the, the labels and the taggers that people need to be aware of so they can inform their families as well? Well, I mean, right now, as I'm, as far as I'm aware, we're in we're entering phase two statewide, and we're vaccinating those that are 16 and older, right? And that's and that's great, but like I said, it doesn't address the problems in our community. So we're still getting infected. We're still, you know, as you know, we we unfortunately, I wish I could say that we were more obedient, but we're not. We have a lot of problems where. We're going to illegal nightclubs where we're visiting, you know, we're still at very active bars. And you know, we like we like a good time. And not everybody's covering and a lot of people are not necessarily using protection the way they should. And so hence our in and given the nature of how we live. So when you combine all of that, the higher, the higher um Contagion rates are reflected, you know, are reflective of that. So, um, but now we're looking at, at individuals that are not just 1A and 1B, uh, which were like the frontline workers, but we're looking at grocery store workers, postal workers, um, uh, folks are, that are basically in the community. I mean, we've done all of our teachers. So there's an increased flexibility at who we're looking to attract now. In fact, as of what I learned as of today is that we're actually running out of people 
of the list that we had of our registrants, we're actually running low. So the question is that we don't have enough people registering right now. So that's the problem that we have. We need more people registering now. And that's why it's so important for a lot of the students that are here to help their parents, their grandparents, their family members, cousins, you know, uncles, aunts to sign up, especially if they don't know how to go to the, the news, the links of how to pre-register for Prince George's County or the state or, you know, Luminous or um, CVS and some, some of the other, I would apply everywhere. Um, we've got, I wanna say over 15 options on where to apply for the vaccine, make use of them. Um, so, so on that end, I would just say, help make sure that we've got everybody registered in, at least in my area. Um, as of March 23rd, we're going to start by appointment, appointment through Luminous to take vaccinations over on Bellcrest and East West Highway. So, and we're looking to establish maybe a two to 3,000 person vaccination site on one day here in, in the Lewisdale Langley Park area. So let's see, let's see if we could deliver on that. Wonderful. And just so all of our um, attendees know, we are compiling all of this information from our guest speakers and also from our community. And we will be giving you all um, a guide sheet on all of this information, right? Where you can get a vaccine, what is the latest in English and in Spanish, so that you can also share it with your community members, family as well. Um, Joshua, we have received a few questions for you. Can you tell us um, more about what COVID-19, the effect of COVID-19 on the elderly population. Um, how does that look like both in the uh, nursing homes right now and also um, out in the field as an EMT? Um, what, are, what are you seeing? Can you share with us? Yeah, so where I work, there's actually two nursing homes next to each other, like less than a mile away. And where I work at Spring Harbor, we haven't had a case of um, COVID and we like we've been very strict with our pro protocols and compared to the nursing home next to us they haven't been doing that well and um where we work what we do is um we go once we go inside we pretty much just clean every one like there's like a there's two doors right one door we have to clean hands um hand sanitizer clean shoes everything and then we take our temperature we have another employee check our temperature for us and then we have a form to fill out explaining if we have any symptoms of the of covid or we you know anything that would lead to us to be to be suspicious of someone being uh, who contracted the virus and um, we always keep it in a record and we always have masks and gloves on and um we always make sure that the residents are always safe and plus um from the question earlier with the vaccine, all of us, all of us have the vaccine, but we always have our masks and gloves on. And it's always, in, you know, so we know that we might not contract the virus, but we know we can still give it. So we always take that precaution. And um, the nursing home near us, I'm not sure what they've done, but I've heard there, there was a many cases of COVID around that area and it's not looking that well. So, what we're seeing, what, to summarize, what, what you're seeing is that once um, we have a majority of people vaccinated, we are still going to be wearing masks, still mm -hmm. yes. attending to the protocols of, of COVID-19, washing our hands, making sure that uh, we are staying six feet apart from people. Um, but in doing so, like you said, there are there are little um, little infections in, in the nursing homes. Is yeah, that for right? us everything that we did before we got the vac vaccinated, we still do it even though we're vaccinated. And so far the results have shown that n not, we haven't had a case of COVID. Like it's, it's hard to believe, I, 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 I guess, but like, it's true. So we're very proud of that. And, um, you know, we always try to be safe. And like, like I said, we always check, we have an employee check, double check for us when we check in and before we go to work. That's, that's wonderful to hear and I'm and I'm glad that you mentioned um, the safety protocols that you guys still maintain despite having the vaccine um, yeah. and, and no visitors too we, we didn't have visitors at that time too so that's why that might be at that time we everybody stay there only employees 
I think it's important to note what Josh was saying in that once you get the vaccine, don't expect a sudden decrease in your normal mask wearing, you know, sanitation protocols, because as much as you have received the vaccine, it is a rollout process. And until we don't have the majority of the country vaccinated, it will be the same quarantining protocols that we have had thus far because it stops being about us and it starts becoming about how we take care of others and prevent the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we, we only have a few minutes left and we wanna go into our last piece before opening up the platform for more questions and answers, if that's okay with everyone. So our last piece is just on any available um, resources, registration tips, any, you know, folks, um, Denny, you, you, Council Member Denny, you said, you know, people aren't registering, right, to the, to the extent that they need to. What are some tips for people who might be struggling with that right now? Um, what are some tips on ways that they can register their family members, especially parents, um, grandparents, right, the folks that are eligible at this point? Okay, so here's here's my recommendation. The thing is, if you guys don't, if your maybe your grandparent or anybody doesn't have a computer, maybe is illiterate, doesn't know how to read or write, you know, those are some of the challenges that exist within our community. So we need to be sensitive to that and meet people where they are. So ask people to call in three one one, and that's a way that people can register via phone. Everybody's got a phone. Um, if they, in, they can go and they can still register through you, you've got a phone, you can register for them <laughs> on their behalf. Um, and, and that would be helpful. Um, uh, and you can look for different sites. There's the state level site that's, you, you could go to the state site to register. You could go to the county site where the person lives to register. You could look at the local hospitals that are administering um, COVID, if, especially if, if your um, family member is a, is a patient, like if they go to CCI or if they go to Mary Center or like Clinica del Pueblo, you know, they could get um, a, the vaccine there. Um, and at worst case scenario, there is a way that if you're connected to your local civic association, your local church, um, a lot of churches are getting pop-up sites for you to go, as long as you're registered, you could just show up to your church and get and get vaccinated. Um, and so when they have pop-up events, like we just did with Turner AME um, here in, in, in Carroll Highlands on the 17th. Um, there is also ways for you to, um, I just want to make sure that I covered all the options because I, there's, because I, I think I'm forgetting one. Um, oh, so if you are connected to your local civic association site and like, there's always like, I, don't, I call it like Radio Meeting Formando. There's always like one community person that knows all the dirt on everybody. Like if you know that person, right? That's the person we go to. And if you go to Radio Meeting Formando, that, that's, how, that's what we call that person. If you get that person, that person may be locked, um, clicked on to receive messages from the local government to say, hey, this we've got availability on vaccines that are available right now at this location. So we've got a community, like I've got, a, I got a contact right now who receives messages from the hospital when they run, when they run out of patients that let's say there were no shows or whatever, and they're short for patients, but they've got extra vaccine and they've got to use that vaccine by a certain period of time. They say, hey, we've got X number of vaccines available today. Make yourself available, come in and get them. And so you just go walk in and get it and, and come out. And so that's, those are kind of the, the tricks of the trade. If you are, um, if you are over uh, 65 and older and have not, especially if you're over 75, if you're within phase 1A and 1B and you have not gotten vaccinated, like if you're in the 80s, 70s and you have not gotten vaccinated, 
I would truly contact my local representative and tell them you want to get vaccinated. I've been, because people, my seniors who have tried and tried and tried and have not gotten appointments, they called me and they said, I want to get vaccinated. Um, and I made it happen. So within a couple of hours, they got a call and, and we set them up to get vaccinated. So there are, there are ways to get around, around that. In terms of other resources for families that are struggling with the rent, um, utilities, and those kinds of things because of loss of job and whatever, we know that a lot of us have gotten hard hit. We are in a position now that we are distributing, I want to say, I want to say over 20, 20, well, I know for sure it's over $25 million. That's all the, that's more than double of all the money that we distributed all of last year. So it's not a lack of money. Right now, we are distributing a lot of rental assistance that will cover up to six months, right? And so if you are, if you are in need of rental assistance and you live in an apartment building, uh, my, my recommendation is to for you to go to your rental office and say that you want your rental office to apply on your behalf if they have not done so already. They should have already done so. Um, uh, we've received, I wanna say, over 500 applications. Um, and we're getting, and we're, we're about 200 deep in the review and we're gonna turn them around. And that's as of this, the program launched March 4th and we're on March 19th. And so things are moving. So make sure you get in, make sure you, you're covered and make sure that your rent is taken care of so you're not displaced. And there is a program that if you need assistance um, in your language um, and you want to um, get your, let's say your landlord, you live in a basement and, and the landlord does not want to apply on your behalf, um, there are ways that you could go and apply individually through um, Casa, de, Casa, Casa de Maryland, Hip Home, Seed. There are organizations near you that all of them have bilingual workers that speak your language and can be able to assist you. But please do not hesitate. Please do not stall and get this done fast because the money can run out. So the faster you are, the quicker you are, the slicker you are and you'll get the work done. So take care of it. And that's gonna be a lesser problem that you have. Um, and also if you want, please make sure that you receive my newsletters. That way you find out on these kinds of opportunities to, to benefit on the help that's being provided on utilities um, and so on here in the county and in the state. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll be sure to include that in our resources. Um, Flavia or Joshua, do you want to add anything on how folks can register or any resources that you're aware of? I have some, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure Mrs. Uh, Tavares has more information on her, uh, her county. Um, I just like to add that there are places like CVS and Giant that are offering vaccinations for people that are, uh, I think, phase 1C at the moment. Um, and I think I'll, I'll send you those links um, that I have compiled um, after the meeting. Um, it is kind of like a come okay, get we'll, it we'll quickly. Get. Yeah, come and get it quickly vaccine. Like whoever's first come first serve is, is the person that's going to get the vaccine really. And, and they do go quickly. They do go quickly. So it's something that you have to be constantly, uh, constant looking at. I'd like to advise people that um, I, I had a, with my dad, works in the food delivery business and he he transports um, Takis. I don't know if you guys know Takis, the chips. Um, and he is very hard with English, doesn't know English too well. He doesn't, um, he, he's very much a very Peruvian, born Peruvian, still Peruvian man. And so getting him the vaccine was complicated because we were on the verge of does he qualify for an essential worker, uh, other essential workers under the phase 1C. So I think it's important to note that from that experience um, that people that don't believe they might be uh, part of phase 1C might be part of phase 1C. So he classified under 
food and agricultural production workers, um, which is the, uh, because he's been working constantly delivering uh, those uh, food deliveries to Walmart's targets being exposed to a number of people. And so he was provided a letter by his company that stated that he was uh, eligible for the vaccine. So it's just a message to people that may be uh, unaware, you know, if they have been working through the pandemic, that they might be eligible. And so I advise them to talk to their employees and, and see how they can receive maybe a letter from them stating that they are, uh, you know, essential frontline workers and then they would be able to sign up using one of the links provided. Thank you all. Joshua, do you wanna add anything? Sorry, I think you're on mute, Joshua. <laughs> like Flavia said, we have like a whole Google Docs with full of resources and there's links where you guys can sign up right away. So we already have it provided for you guys. Thank awesome. you. Awesome, thank you so much. Yes. I think it's important to to sum up at what all of our wonderful panelists had said. Um, currently, we are in 1C, phase 1C of uh, vaccine registration. And as Governor uh, Hogan had mentioned earlier on in the week, we will be moving on to phase two um, on Monday, I believe. And then soon thereafter, um, and that's phase 2A. So that's everybody 60 and above. And then moving on into uh, phase 2B, um, uh, there, thereafter shortly, um, and by May, moving into phase three. Um, it's important to note that the state is working um, very hard to provide the vaccine to uh, all of Maryland residents um, in an equitable uh, manner. Um, however, that will take time. So some of the great advice that we received from our panelists today, um, just to sum it up, is to register at your state at the state, at the county, uh, maybe even at the city level. Contact your council members if you are 60, um, 60, 65, 80 and above, especially your mom, your dad, your grandparents that have not received the vaccine, that you are having trouble receiving the vaccine for them because um, the process might be difficult to navigate. Um, contact your council members. We will be sending out all of the links um, and all of the resources that they have mentioned to you all um, shortly after the meeting, um, no later than Monday, uh, so that you all can, can then um, register yourselves, uh, register your parents, your friends, um, invite everyone to register for the vaccine um, as soon as you become available so that we all can you know, reach that herd immunity that Flavia was uh, discussing earlier. Yes, and, and I just want to add quickly, like, what brought us to create this event? I know we didn't really talk about that as much in the beginning, but just, I think, grounding us in, in purpose is really important, right? And this came from a brilliant idea that one of our board members had, Maritza Gonzalez, who I know is with us today, um, and she was having difficulties, right, registering her family members because the platforms that are being used are not in Spanish right now, many of them, or they're not as user-friendly as they can be. And those are things that we as Latinos, right, need to be cognizant of and know that if we have access to resources, if we are able, if we are bilingual, right, for instance, or if we have more time and we work from home and we're able to support each other, how we can do that. And I know that's something that um, the Latinx Alumni Network at the University of Maryland really wants to do. So if you're also having difficulties, please let us know. We'll put our email in the chat, but we wanna really support our community right now because as council member Tavera said there's we're disproportionately affected right there our rates are going up and up and we've all I have family members who have had received COVID had been infected luckily they didn't pass away but the risk is real the situation is real and the more that we can uplift each other and be aware of the hurdles the more that we can find ways to combat them together so thank you for joining us we are opening up now the space yes it's council member Denny Taveras um I see your hand is up do you want to say anything Yes. I don't know. Are you closing or are we still kind of? No, no, no. We're going to go into questions and answers um, right now from, from our community, right? Like the questions that our folks have. I'm already getting some in the chat. Um, so we're going to open up the flap platform. Okay. I just want I just want a minute before people leave to, to just mention and do a little plug. If you allow me, I am working to establish or we're working to uh, create 
the Prince George's County Professional Latino Alliance. So if you're interested, you consider yourself a professional, you consider yourself a Latino, you consider yourself somebody who's working in Prince George's County or lives in Prince George's County, you work in a professional capacity, we want you, we're after you. And I want to make sure that you are part of this effort as we grow. So please be sure to reach out. Um, I know Pamela and Karen will uh, share with you my email and my contact information. So please send that over so we can, we're meeting next month. So, all right, get to it. Thank you. Thank you. And I already have a question. Um, so if it's okay, we can go into questions and then um, I know we also have raffles tonight, so please stay with us. We're going to announce two raffle winners. And, and then Jose is going to go into announcements on how our high school students can get their community service hours for tonight. Um, so the question that I have is, what happens if the vaccine providers are asking for someone's social security numbers? And maybe Mrs. Tavares can answer this, but very plain simply, they won't. They just won't ask you. And if they do, then you can talk to someone above them or somebody else. And because that is not part of the, uh, I guess, uh, the rollout plan that they're asking. They've never, they've never, I, yeah. I wasn't asked for Social Security and no one ever. They would, they will ask for insurance cards if you do have one. If you don't, it's okay. Um, I think that they'll ask you for your name. And I think the critical thing is, is like your name, address, um, race information, I think is important. Please reveal your race um, and, and those kinds of questions. But we do not ask for social security number or anything or any kind of payment. So if you're giving money, you shouldn't. Um, and, uh, and if you do have insurance, that's great. We can charge the insurance, but if you don't, there is a federal program in place that's covering the expense of the vaccine right now. And that's how, that's who's covering it. It doesn't happen. You're not just getting a magical vaccine. There, somebody is paying for it and it is your tax dollars at work. I, I think it's I, th I think it's important just to add to that is the, um, is the difference between clinical and mass vaccination sites. So at clinical, I, I haven't been personally, I have been to a mass vaccination site. In those places, they will only ask for your driver's license and the QR code, which you made your appointment with, but no other paperwork. And like Ms. Tavares said, no money is required. Um, and I don't believe they asked for an insurance card there. But there, then again, there may be differences between the mass vaccination sites and the uh, local clinics that are providing um, the vaccine. I went to the county site, and the county, and the county site did. Um, they asked for it, you know. But it's if you have it, great. If you don't, you keep it moving. You just say you don't. Um, but the, and I was asked for my insurance card for um, for COVID nineteen tests. Again, if you have it, great. If you don't, but we just keep it moving. So I'm sorry, and, and I'm uh, Viviana, and I'm the one that asked that question. And the reason that I posed it is because we have heard already that there are places that have actually asked for social security numbers, like across the United States. I, I actually am the, I'm Latina, but I'm also the, the state and local advocacy attorney at clinic. And so it's one of my jobs to kind of keep track of these things. And this, the thing with Maryland just popped up this week. And so I've been very concerned, especially because if you're an undocumented immigrant, you're going to be so afraid to push back and to be like, I want to see your manager. Like, let's take this up. Like, that's just not going to happen. So I've been trying Mama, to figure out. Where did it happen? Hmm? Where? Where did it happen? Uh, Frederick, which, you know, understand. I mean, it's Frederick, but still. I mean, if it's happening in Frederick, we'll take care of it. I'll, I'll talk to Jocelyn. She's, she's the deputy um, Jocelyn is the head, the deputy um, um, a chair person on the health committee in the state house. Oh, fantastic! We got people in power that we could take care of that. Oh, great! Thank you, council members, for taking care of that. We have uh, another question um, for those that are returning back to school soon. Is it safe to have lunch? because that requires taking off our masks. I'm sorry, so, say that again. It, 
For those returning back to school, is it safe to have lunch because that requires taking off our masks? Okay, I, I can answer this if you'd like. Um, there's no clear cut way to answer this, right? Because it is like, if you take off your mask, then you are more exposed to the virus, right? And on the other hand, people have to eat, right? So I think what the CDC is and has been um, offering for a while is try to stay as distant as possible. I know that may be hard in cafeterias. Uh, I don't know how the school system, personally, I don't know how the school system is dealing with that. Um, but I would suggest if possible, eating outside or eating in uh, open fields or areas. Um, like I said, there's no clear cut way of, of answering that question. Patricia, I see your hand up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because um, that was one of my concerns working at High Point High School when we have almost 3,000 students. Um, right now, the majority of course are going to continue distance learning. Uh, and so we have about maybe 700 students who are going to be coming into the building, okay? Um, they have been divided in two groups. Uh, some students are going to be there Monday and Tuesday. Other students are going to be there Thursday and Friday. And of course we are trying, the administration has been working very, very hard. There is going to be lunch, okay? Uh, and so what they have done is they had already, they already had in place their uh, tables. There's tables, individual tables. And so groups of students are going to be coming and the uh, tables are like six feet apart so that we can try to keep the distance. So the school, at least at my school, the administration is working very, very hard uh, about that. Of course, they're going to have to take their mask off because they're going to eat lunch. And so I think students are going to have to cooperate and try to follow the instructions because we are trying our best for students to be safe. But students are going to have to do it. And sometimes, you know, being teenagers, adolescents, they think they are invisible. <laughs> I'm sorry, they don't listen, so, yeah. but I know every single school, at least at my school, the administration is working very, very hard and they're trying to see, to send groups and that's what we're going to have in the building, maybe 350 students at a time in addition of almost 200 staff members. So that's one of the concerns, how we're going to do it, but they're, they're trying, they're trying very hard. Mm -hmm. Ms. I, I have a question. Go for it. So about, so since you go to High Point, I don't go to High Point, but I go to another school in PG County. And my question is about the cafeterias. So if kids can't get into cafeteria lines and they're serving the foods, what about people who like maybe vegetarian, like they can't get into the line that they have for people who may want like a simple style? Like does everyone have to eat the same food now because it's being distributed or the lines are going to be six feet apart. Mm, I, I don't know if I can answer a little bit because I'm talking about my school. Okay. Um, they are trying for the students to get online, but they're going to have to respect the distance. So about menu, you go I'm not sure. Or yesterday? I'm sorry? Did you go back to school today or yesterday? No, I've been in school since the beginning of the school year, but it was only two days a week. Okay. But since last week, we have been there every single day. So then how did you eat there? Oh, we bring our own lunch. There is no students yet. Students are coming back uh, uh, April 8th, and it's going to be seniors only in um, special education. Okay, so you eat in your classroom? We, we we have our own place. You know, I eat at my desk. I, I don't stop working. I'm just working and eating. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Divine. And just to add a little bit on that, uh, uh, Dr. Golson and the Board of Education for Prince George's County, they will have a, um, a, a call-in forum in this upcoming week. I can send you that information if you like, and you can ask that question. I believe it's by next Wednesday or next Thursday. But let me check the date, and, and that was a great question. So I invite other students that are concerned 
this is your space to ask those questions. I think it's going to be Monday. Thank I, you. It's going to be Monday. Monday. The forum is going to be Monday, and you can just call in, uh, and, and you can ask those questions to the to the ones that know that that develop the plan, the ones that have the plan, and everyone here who attend Princess County Public School Systems. The, I invite you to please listen in and tune in and get educated. Knowledge and education is power, and you are the one to make your voice heard and and voice your concerns. And so every school, every, every parent, every family, every student is going to receive the invitation to join the meeting. Wonderful. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Divine, for asking those wonderful questions. I have a question here from one of our participants. Uh, maybe Denny can answer this. Are there any plans to bring a site, uh, and I think it's a mass vaccination site, to Northern uh, Prince George's County specifically to assist the Latino population? Yes, ma'am, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we, we have one in Laurel um, that, it, that, it, that already exists. Um, again, it's just an issue of, you know, getting the appointments, getting registered and getting the appointments to be able to, to visit there. Um, locally here, in terms of trying to get something in the Lewisdale Langley Park area, um, yes. And I think that we're also looking at different strategies, right? So right now, today we were in conversations. We're trying to figure out what we want to employ, whether it's door-to-door -door by household, um, do a massive two to 3,000 person vaccination site type event. Uh, looking at right now, I was proposing the use of Lane Manor, where we typically have the Hispanic Festival. Um, that could be a good site for us to consider. Um, and so we're looking at different options right now of what would fit for us. And it has to be walkable um, for our population because not everybody has a car. And we're looking, and we're looking actually interestingly enough at using some high level technology to kind of measure, I don't know, scientists and us trying to inquire, looking at um, cell data and looking at this, um, the cell data from the from your cell phone and try to create um, circles, radius circles around areas to do an encatchment that, that to, to identify appropriate locations where we can um, drop these sites where people can, can, can visit a particular site and we would capture those households around that particular area in areas that are disproportionately affected, meaning individuals that haven't been vaccinated, have high contagion, high poverty, have the social stressors that we just highlighted um, in the past. So we're trying to figure that out as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I received a question that I thought was interesting because I also um, had this question, but uh, Angel says, why are some vaccines for 16 and up while others are for 18 and up? Um, to answer simply is the research that Pfizer did. So Pfizer tested on 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds and higher. Moderna and Johnson & Johnson have not. Therefore, they don't feel comfortable promoting their vaccine for anyone that has not been tested properly. Thank you. I have... Um, oh, go ahead, Pam. Go ahead. Um, there's one for you, Denny, as well. It says, what are resources that are being provided specifically for immobile elderly seniors, those with limited Wi-Fi, lack of computer literacy, and in need of assistance? Are there any bilingual hotlines we can share with the most vulnerable? Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. So in terms of the, in terms of the illiterate and the need for bilingual, that's 311, right? You call 311, we'll get an interpreter or we'll get somebody who speaks Spanish to address those needs and be able to respond and answer those questions. Um, that's the easy, especially if they don't have Wi-Fi, computer access. Um, but we ask to, for the, for especially for the youth, you know, you you might have family and we may not be as connected. We just ask for you to reach back and help those in your family 
that may be a little older um, and, and, for, and help them, you know, walk it through for them. If they can't, if let's say if it's on a Saturday and 311 is closed, you know, help them out. Uh, the other thing is that um, for the immobile and people with ADA concerns, we have three vans. You need to call to arrange an appointment um, and we will come to you and administer the vaccine, especially if you're homebound. Um, so those are particularly, not only will they vaccinate you, they will vaccinate your caretaker. Um, especially, let's say in those cases that we have some, we have some cases here where we have hospices in different homes and we've got nurses working in the homes. We also have cases that I've seen when I'm door knocking for my community where I've seen um, like the children pay an individual to take care of their parent or their family member. And so um, that individual stays in the home. So in, in, the, in the family member that's homebound, you know, they stay in a hospital in a hospital bed inside the home. And so those those are the cases of what we're talking about. We'll bring the vaccine to you. And so you could arrange that also through 311. And can I just add um, on Facebook, there's a group that's called the Maryland Equity Vaccine Hunters, Cazadores de Vacunas para la Equidad. And they have a bunch of wonderful volunteers, people who just are on there and constantly searching for vaccines as they pop up and trying to get them out to people who are non-English speaking, people with disabilities. They even provide free rides, not just for people with disabilities, but anyone who needs a free ride to a location. They really make sure that they get their, you know, everything from start to finish. So I just can't say enough good things about this place. And, and the Ark of Prince George's County is a site where we're accepting vaccines. It's all Maryland. Vaccines. Care of all of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Viviana, can you share that link, please, for everyone in the chat, if you're able to? I can't, but I can share it with you. Oh, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll post it. Thank you so much. Um, I know we haven't been able to get to everyone's questions. We will. We are taking note. We will save the chat. And so anyone whose question we are not able to um, answer tonight, we will be reaching out to you via email or we will be posting it on our, on our sheet, on our guides, our resource guide that we will be sending out to you all. So just please be on the lookout for that. Thank you so much everyone for participating. Um, and I'll give it on to Pam who's going to announce our, our next um, speaker. Yes. Um... Actually, I'm going to go ahead and give it off to Natalie now, <laughs> who will announce our next speaker. Great. Great. Hello, everyone, again. So I have the pleasure to announce Soma. She is the secretary for Howard County Alumni Network's board, and she will be announcing our raffle winners. We will be doing two raffles. So Soma, if you are online, we'll go ahead and make you the spotlight, and you can go ahead and announce our winners. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. As Natalie said, my name is Soma. I'm on the Howard County um, Alumni Board. Um, so tonight we have two $15 gift cards for Route One, Route One Apparel, where you can get amazing Maryland merchandise. And our two winners today are Carlos Renderos and Kyla Purvis. So Carlos and Kyla, if you could please send me a message in the chat with your email address, um, we will be reaching out to you to distribute the gift cards. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much to Howard County Terps, who've also helped us um, co-sponsor this event tonight. Thank you for your support. Yes, and, and huge shout out to our panelists, Flavia, Council Member Denny Taveras, Joshua. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for answering all of our questions. And for our participants, if you continue to have questions, you can continue to put them in the chat. We will address those, like Karen said. Um, following the meeting. So I will give it off now to Jose, who will be speaking directly to our high school students that are attending. All righty. Now that time that we are waiting for, uh, I will be sharing a, a brief presentation. And when I mean brief, it will take between five to 10 minutes. So bear with me. Uh, and uh, I will be, see if I can project it right now. Okay, do I have, I just checking. 
testing that I have access. Give me one. Okay, for some reason, I lost the screen. And thank you for staying all this time, youth and everyone else. Um, is everybody able to see my screen? Because I cannot see you at all. Yes, yes. Can see it. All right, let me go presentation mode, okay? So our bilingual community COVID-19 vaccine Q&A, community hours contact information survey. So I am moving along with the uh, community uh, service learning hour portion. Um, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you for attending the, the bilingual community COVID-19 vaccine Q&A uh, virtual event sponsored by the Latinx Alumni Network and Howard County Alumni Network or HOCO Terps. Uh, we hope you have learned a lot from our distinguished panelists and experts. For the UMD Latinx Alumni Network to email you the student service learning hours form, we ask you to submit your contact information accurately. Please ensure you provide a personal email. In example, abcd at gmail, abcd at icloud, abcd at yahoo.com, et cetera. And do not, I, I emphasize, I emphasize, do not use your school email. If you use your PGCPS or MCPCS email, we will not be able to email you the service learning hours form. Also, if you would like to ensure that I submit your information, you can email me and I'll be sharing my contact information, your um, community service uh, learning hours uh, form. Thank you for, the, uh, for attending and thank you for your consideration. Now in Spanish. Gracias por asistir al evento virtual para la comunidad bilingüe Preguntas y Respuestas sobre la vacuna COVID-19, patrocinado por la red de alumnado de la NX Alumni Network y la red de alumnado del condado de Howard County, Hoco Terps. Esperamos que haya aprendido la información necesaria de nuestros distinguidos panelistas y expertos para que la red de la, la NX Alumni Network o LAN le envíe el formulario de horas de aprendizaje de servicio comunitario, le pedimos que complete esta encuesta y nos brinde su información personal. Para contactarle, por favor, asegúrese de proporcionar un correo electrónico personal. Por ejemplo, abcd.gmail, abcd.icloud, abcd.yahoo.com, etc. No proporcione, repito, no proporcione un email o correo electrónico de su escuela del condado de PGCPS o de MCPCS. Si utiliza su email, email proporcionado de PGCPS, no podremos enviarle por correo electrónico el formulario de horas de aprendizaje de servicio comunitario. Gracias por su participación y cooperación. Okay, I just want to give a special thank, uh, thank you to everyone uh, of our panelists. In addition, I also want to thank uh, Soma uh, Uma Sulu. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, Soma. Um, uh, and, and she serves as the Secretary of Howard County Turfs Alumni Network. So we are happy in this uh, event and the two um, gift cards or the raffle gift cards were uh, provided by Howard County Turfs. In addition, I wanna please join me in virtual or a round of applause for council member Denny Taveras, Prince George's County Council. Um, please give me another uh, round of applause for Flavia Negrete, uh, bioinformatics graduate student at Maryland and research assistant at the Virulence Mechanisms Division at FDA in Howard County Terps. And Joshua Gavilano, uh, my apologies for the typo, Joshua, I was <laughs> rushing. So CNA in a senior nursing facility at Spring Arbor Assisted Living and also EMT for Howard County. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing everything. And also uh, uh, everybody here uh, participated for the amazing questions. Uh, uh, also community partners that are here like Ms. Benavides. I, I, I worked with you at Howard, uh, at Bladesburg High School a few years ago. And I am glad that you are doing amazing things at, uh, at High Point, who is, which is my alma mater. I attended, I'm an alumni from High Point High School. All sure. right. Yes. Can you please re can you please repeat um where I send my email in order to receive the service? I, I'm about to share the link. I will be getting there. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Thank okay. You. Just just to emphasize, this is the link for the PGCPS host uh, uh, telephone town halls about returning in person learning Monday, uh, March twenty second, two thousand one. Here's the link. I'll, I shared the link already on the chat. Also for the bilingual hotline, para ayuda bilingüe, por favor marque 3111. Is that correct and accurate, uh, Council Member Taveras? Sí. Yes, okay. So any bilingual assistance, you just dial 311. And here's my contact information. Okay, my name is ja.granados26 at gmail.com. This is my personal email. So I will ensure that you receive the, your community service hours. I'll just leave it out there uh, in order so I can, um, and I will also be sharing it shortly once on the one presentation. So is this where we send our email to? Yes, uh, just, uh, yes. And uh, that is my uh, contact information, just to ensure that I receive your information. But I will be now be sharing the, your, uh, the link that you have to complete right now. Okay. So we would like for you to participate. This is where you as the youth come in hand. We want to send encouragement message to our uh, frontline workers. So you will be receiving, an, uh, you will be receiving uh, a link where you can, where you can, uh, where you can uh, uh, submit this thank you message electronically. I'll be sharing that right now. I'm just trying to enable the chat feature and ensure that I'm sharing it with everyone. Okay. I just released the survey. You can start filling it out now. So the, it's, the link is in the chat. Please let me know if you received it. Take the next, um, the next five minutes to complete it. I know this is where it was. <laughs> Once again, uh, thank you, panelists. We really, uh, uh, we really appreciate your time, dedicating some of your uh, busy schedules. I know, and your area of expertise, sharing here with us today. Uh, like I said, this is just the beginning. We invite you to take this uh, conversation and take it uh, along. Um, hopefully, I'm not distracting to those of you who are concentrating in completing the, <laughs> the survey. Uh, it's uh, a few questions, uh, but please uh, provide as much uh, as brief, uh, uh, I mean, provide as much information as you can. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Council Member uh, Denny Taveras, Flavia, Joshua. Uh, and Soma and any Howard uh, County Turfs uh, representatives. We, uh, we have enjoyed uh, having you here. And this event was, it happened in a matter of a month. It started like, like uh, Karen shared uh, share earlier, Maritza, one of our board members at large, she felt like we need to do something about it. You are someone, you are somebody, your voice matter, our representation matter. So please take this conversation and share them. Uh, be the amplifying voice for your families, be the amplifying voice for yourself and also for your school community, uh, for your teachers, uh, for everyone. Um, uh, and, and start for yourself. Uh, advocacy starts for yourself and everybody in here is an advocate. So our panelists, uh, if you, uh, I just wanna open the floors. If you wanna have any last messages that you wanna share with the youth uh, and if not, you're free to go.
and you you please ensure that you do not log off until you finish and submit that uh, survey. Thank you so much, Jose. I just want to quickly mention that um, in the chat, I've also put in some of the vaccine hunters. There's three different groups. Um, so if you just want to check that out and share that with any uh, folks in your family, in your community, if you're having help, if you're having difficulties getting those vaccines, please check out those resources. As um, Viviana said earlier, you know, these are folks who are volunteering who are um, able to have the time to look at different websites to make sure that people are getting the vaccines and the appointments that they need. So check those out. I've used them for my family members and I can definitely guarantee that they've worked. So definitely check those three out. And like we had mentioned before, everyone, we will be sending out these resources to you all. So if you uh, did not, were not able to catch all of the resources that we were mentioning, this will go out, um, you know, no later than uh, Monday or Tuesday to you all so that you can all start uh, benefiting from those resources. Yes, and I also just want to give a huge, huge, huge shout out to um, Hilda, who has been our fabulous interpreter this evening. And we all know, I know that interpretation is not easy, um, right? Especially for some of the conversations and technical uh, terms that we use tonight. Um, so thank you so much, Ms. Hilda, for, for doing that great work to making sure that the message tonight was accessible to everyone in our community. Wonderful. And opening it up to our panelists, our wonderful panelists, for any last words. I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm glad that I was able to offer a little bit of knowledge um, and any assistance that our community may need. And I hope that everyone goes forth and has a wonderful time registering and hopefully getting the vaccine sooner rather than later. So thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you for giving me giving me the opportunity to help. And um, I hope everybody gets vaccinated soon and sign up. Uh, well, as for me, I want to say thank you again to everybody. And um, I think your your peak was 69, I believe. Uh, congratulations. That was an amazing, amazing turnout. I wish I could have as good as turnout. <laughs> on my event sometimes. Um, and just be sure if you want to reach out to me, um, my email, my personal email is D Tavera, T-A, D as in David, T as in Tom, A-V-E-R-A-S at gmail.com. So if you're interested in the Professional Latino Alliance or whatever, um, uh, the other proposals that I might have discussed with you, please reach out to me so that we can pull you in and make you part of the familia. All right. So with that, I hope everybody's taken care of and stay in contact. And hopefully, you know, I'll see you in the community. God bless. Thank you, Council Member Taveras. Oh, I can say a few last words as well. I just wanted to say thank you to Natalie and the Latinx Alumni Network for allowing us to partner with you all for such an informative and amazing event. Um, and thanks again to the panelists, Joshua, Flavia, and Councilwoman Taveras. Flavia and I are friends from Maryland, so I'm glad that she agreed to join the event, and I think she did an amazing job. <laughs> thanks again. And I just want to give out about the raffle. So please ensure that you reached out to either uh, 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 one of us. Definitely, these are uh, thank you so much for Howard County Turks for sponsoring this event and giving us the raffles. So those two lucky lucky winners, can you repeat the names one more time, Soma? Yes, it was Carlos Renderos and Kyla Purvis. And I received both of their emails and I'll be sending out an email to both of them. Thank you.
Well, everyone, once again, thank you so much on behalf of LAN and HOCO Terps. Thank you so much to our dear three panelists, Council Member Denise Veras, Joshua Gavilano, and our, our alumni, Flavia Negrete. We truly appreciate the time and all the information that you shed on everyone. You know, hopefully everyone was able to learn more about the COVID vaccine, debunk some myths. Um, and thank you. We appreciate your time with us today. Thank you so much. And just quickly, for Vivian, we already sent an email to the health officer in uh, Frederick County. So that's been taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so great. Thank you so much. No problem. That's what we're here for. Thank you so much. See how quick we are. This is the, what happened. This is uh, how we affect change. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Taveras. And thank you, Vivian, for bringing that and amplifying the voices because we cannot let our people go without the vaccine. We deserve, we matter, we need to ask for those vaccines uh, because they, they are, they're for us, they're ours. No, yeah. of course, absolutely. Yes, and, and exactly it. These are, the, these are the conversations that we wanted to have, right? To amplify our voices, to reach some equity, but also to give you guys a little bit more of resilience. Our, our communities are resilient communities. So, you know, let's, let's, let's get together, start getting our, our, our people registered for this vaccine, start looking for these vaccines so that we can have, you know, a healthier life going forward. And if you want to help out, you could maybe set up next to the vaccine site and register people to vote. But just a suggestion, I don't know, mind you, I'm just suggesting, I don't know, I'm not my business. <laughs> yeah. Love it, it's field, yes. <laughs> All right, mi gente. So take care. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye. Take care. Everyone have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.